I would like to introduce our special guest artist. Please give a round of applause to Mr. Mike Stilke. Thank you all for coming. I'd also like to introduce the person beside him, who is his gallerist from L.A., Mr. Bo Bass. Here we go. When did you start painting on books? Um, I started painting on books in about maybe 2005, 2006. But before that, I was painting in books for years, uh, probably since 1999, 2000. I would paint inside the books. I was really attracted to old books, and I liked to paint on the old pages. So I would go to thrift stores, and I would find these old pages and pull the pages out and paint on those. And eventually, I started painting on top of the books themselves. And then it evolved into the smaller sculptures like this, and now the massive sculptures like this. So how do you go again? How do you go about getting your books again? I used to get them at thrift stores, and then now I actually get them from libraries. So in, in uh, Los Angeles, there's tons of libraries, and they get new books. And as the new books come in, they take the old books, and they give them to a, a store called Friends of the Library. Friends of the Library then has a giant sale, and they sell all the old books. And then whatever doesn't sell, they take and they throw in the trash. So then I go and get them out of the trash and paint on them. <laughs> So what was it that actually attracted you to paint on books? Um, more or less, it's just I was attracted to painting on things that weren't particularly white. Um, like if I bought a canvas, I would just bring it home and stare at it, and I wouldn't know what to do with it. So I would, I would go and try to find objects that I could paint on that I didn't necessarily care about as much and, and not think about. And so I would pick up old record covers, I would pick up old books, old pieces of wood I found on the street, and just paint on them. And I always just kind of felt like it had more soul. I could look at it, and, and I could already see the painting that was there, as opposed to something that was white. Okay, so tell us about this piece that you, you have behind you, and how it came into being. Yeah, I, I actually hope it doesn't fall down on us, because that would be a real shame. Um, that would be ironic, though, right? <laughs> Artists killed by books. Um, this particular piece um, I did for a show in Hong Kong Times Square last year, July. And I actually painted it in Los Angeles. So I built a piece up in Los Angeles and rented a space and had painted there. But the space I rented was too small. So it was the, the ceilings were what, how, 17 feet tall or 14 feet tall. And this piece is, I think, 22, 23, 24 feet tall, somewhere around there. And so I had to paint it in two sections. So I had to paint first, I had to paint the head, and then next to it I had to try to figure out how to match up the bottom part. So I took a picture and glued them together and, and painted both parts and said, I think it's perfect. And then we shipped it to Hong Kong, and when it arrived in Hong Kong, it was not perfect when we put it up. It was, it was totally wrong. So I had to fix it when I was in Hong Kong. Um, so, yeah, that was... That, that's how it got there. Um, Can you tell us how you actually install this? Like, what's, what's the whole process in well, setting something up like this? Actually, uh, obtaining the books first is a, a, a real nightmare. Um, once you get all the books, you know, they come with dust jackets. And what the library does is they tape it on with this industrial tape that's impossible to get off. So you have to cut all four quarters of the dust jacket off first, off of, like, you know, 4,000 of books or how many there are. So I get assistance to help me take off just the covers, which takes about a day or two. And then I start to build it in sections. So I build it in these small sections and I'll glue them together, put them across, and then I'll start a new row. And as I go up, I'll bracket it to the wall. So I get the entire structure up first, and then I'll paint the, the piece. And how long does something like this take to install? To install it, it, from start to finish, uh, this piece took me about two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. And how did this get to Manila? So it went from L.A. to Hong Kong. Then it was in Hong Kong for a month, and then we, we tried to figure out what to do with such a large piece. Because it it, you know, it's easy to find homes for the small ones, but obviously this is so giant that you know, we had to wrap our heads around what to do with it. And actually, Bo here... Yeah. Uh, in Los Angeles, one of our clients uh, is the proprietor here of, of Fully Booked, 
And uh, when we were looking for a home for this installation, this is actually the, what do you say, the largest yeah, piece this yeah, size yeah. you've ever done. Um, we actually were, were very lucky that uh, Mr. Diaz w thought this would be a perfect installation here at, at Fully Booked. And so we made arrangements to bring it here, bring Mike here, and uh, hopefully everybody appreciates the, uh, the scale of this. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about your paintings. We, we have a show and we have some pieces of yours that are up here on the side for sale. What do the characters and animals represent in your paintings? I try not to really think about what I'm painting, per se. Like I, I love to just let things come out. So especially the woman that comes out, often always looks exactly like my wife. She tells everybody that it's her, of course. Um, but I don't really think about it, you know. Um, they're more or less just portraits, but I would say most of the time, it's whatever I'm feeling happens to translate into the character I'm painting on the page. And I love, and I also, I'm like a really big fan of animals. I love animals, and I'm a vegetarian. And we have a house full of cats, we have a snake, and I grew up around animals my whole life. So I always, I always felt that animals had, they have such a soul and such like this uh, human characteristic, characteristic to them. You know, even my cats, each cat, each one is so different that I've always thought that we're, we're really all kind of the same thing, you know, just in a, in a different form. So I, that's why I often give the animals... Uh, I'll give them like human hands or something like that. Um, last last night I think you showed one of your hobbies, so maybe you can tell the tell the people here about it. Well, one of the main reasons I was so excited to come to the Philippines is, is because I'm a huge pool player and I love playing pool. So I was like, Efren Reyes, oh, let's go see Efren Reyes, uh, Ronnie O'Connell, all these people. So um, last night actually, Jaime and and Bo and I we went to. Uh, we went to Jay's one side in Mabini, and Ronnie Alcano happened to be there. So I got to play with, you know, one of my idols in the Philippines, which was like the greatest experience ever, you know. And so that's that's sort of how I I balance my what I'm doing artistically. I'm not particularly a painter that can paint 14 hours a day. Some people, oh, I've been in the studio for two days, like that. That just that would, I'd kill myself. It just is too much. So. I can paint for about a five hour stretch and then I need to leave. And so usually I'll go play pool and I'll go play pool for a few hours and then I can come back to painting and it's like a whole new day. Where else have you shown in the world? Um, I've shown throughout the US. I've shown in Switzerland. I've shown in the UK. Um, I've had two shows in Hong Kong. Um, uh, did I say Italy? Yeah, Italy. Um, I know there's one other one, but I can't. Oh yeah, and I've done a lot of fairs and all over the world. I actually have some stuff in a fair right now in Amsterdam. I just did one in Germany. Um, so all over the place, and the Philippines. Thanks, Jaime. Okay. Where do you see your art five years from now? Um, when I try to envision w what I want to be doing in five years, I, I always see, there's always this museum setting and I see giant paintings throughout the whole museum and it, it always happens to be the MoCA in Los Angeles, I don't know why, but yeah, th that's where I hope to be in five years. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you are the artist that pioneered painting on books and Correct. I believe that you've been imitated on this? I have, but every time they've imitated me, they paint the exact same thing I painted, which I still don't understand that, but <laughs> thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we do have a mic. Actually, no mic. Okay, well, we will be starting the Q&A shortly. If any of you does want to ask any questions, feel f please feel free to go in the middle and we'll pass the mic to you. Okay, are there any questions so far? Or unless I can hear them, I'll repeat it. Okay, Filipinos are very shy, so yeah. I'll keep asking away. Y you didn't tell us, by the way, what what happened with uh, with the duel you had with Ronnie Alcano. Did you did you win? Uh, no, Ronnie Alcano absolutely killed me. Yes, but but, but you won one game, right? One game, yes. Woohoo! <laughs> and you wanna sh you wanna share how you won that game? Yeah, he missed. He missed the 10 ball, so that's how I won that game. <laughs> <laughs> he is that good, yes. <laughs>
wondering what type of paint did you use there? since it's a book? There's so many different types of materials on each book that the paint doesn't really like to stick to particular books. So I use acrylic paint. And, but um, it's definitely challenging. There's, there's particularly um, like dark red books. When you paint over those particularly, if you paint white, it'll be white and you'll come back a half an hour later and it will be pink. So there's a lot of pigment in some of the books. So I, I mean, it's taken me years to really figure out how to actually paint over these books. So now, now I have it figured out. Now I can, I, I can handle it. Um, maybe if they, you can even ask a question here. You don't have to get up here, and I can repeat the question too if you're shy to get up. Is there any symbolism in, the, in this piece? Yeah, actually, that's a great question. Um, the title of the show is Discarded Romance, and like I was saying before, that when I go to libraries and they give me their old books um, a lot of times they'll have a basement that's it's sort of like another library in the basement and they go through and when they get rid of sections he'll he'll call me and say you know hey we have you know 2000 books here and when i picked up this particular batch of books it was all romance books so i thought and and a lot of these inside the book it says discarded so it was you know it named itself do you ever read do you ever read the books that you that you've been given the nature of I can't read. No, I'm kidding. Yes, of course. Um, I actually pull out s far too many books. <laughs> Our house is filled with books because I'm like, ooh, I like this book. I got to take this book. So yeah, we have an entire library filled with, with our own books and then all the books I've collected. And then there's books in my studio and then there's books in a storage unit that I have that's about, filled with about 10,000 books. And then I have another storage area that has about 3,000 books. Um, yeah, there's there's books coming out of my ears, so. Uh, I'm not sure know, but sort of, like you have the large installation, and then you have the smaller installation as well as the bigger pieces. Um, do you have a preference in terms of what you know what you're working on, or whether it's paper or a small book or large installation? Uh, how, how do you decide what you sort of prefer to work on, which directions you go? Well, I'm easily distracted, and I get really bored. So I move from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. So I'm constantly working on a paper piece, a piece on wood, a piece on books, a giant piece, and I'll just sort of go all over the board. And um, yeah, it'll drive, people I work with, it drives crazy. But uh, it's just how, it's how my brain works. That's how I get things done. If I were to set things up and say, I'm going to paint 10 book sculptures in a row, I, would, I wouldn't do it. I'd be playing Ronnie Alcano. Yes. <laughs> Can you tell us about your formal training? How, how did you become an artist? Um, I, I didn't have any formal art training at all. Um, I had some photography training. So I, was, I, I, did, um, I took some classes in school for photography, worked at a camera store for a little while, but it really wasn't my thing. And during that time, I was, just, I was drawing a lot, and I, was, I knew a lot of people that, that painted and, and, and did that sort of thing, and, it, and I just loved it. And I, I just drew every day, and I was absolutely terrible. And... I, but I figured, you know, I can, eh, whatever, this is fun. I got, maybe I'll get a little bit better and uh, progressively, progressively. And then one day I had a show and I was horribly insecure. And somebody said, you know, you should have the show. Your work's good. Uh, so I said, okay, I'll have a show. And I showed about 20 paintings and I ended up selling almost the whole show. So it was just eye opening, like, wow, oh my God, these people, you know, they liked my work. So then I had another show and another show and another show. And, you know, now I've been doing it for about 10 years pretty seriously. Maybe you can tell us about the experience, how your first gallery got to... Oh, yeah. Well, it wasn't my first gallery, but it was a, the first real gallery. So it's, very, it's easy to get work into small galleries or shows in L.A., but they're not going to be like a real gallery. To get into a real gallery, you have to work pretty hard. So there was a gallery... In, in, in Los Angeles, in Culver City, and that's where the that's where the gallery scene is now, called Black Market Gallery. And I went to a show there, and it was the first real art show that I went to. And I walked in, and I and I was just blown away. I, I this, I'd never seen anything like it, and I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Wow, I'm gonna email her. So I went home, and I said, Hey, my name's Mike. I live around the corner, and I like art too. You know, and I attached a picture, right? So she wrote me back, and she was like, why don't you come down and, and see me? And I said, okay. So I went down to the gallery. She's like, sit down on the couch. 
I'm like, okay. So I, I'm thinking, oh, she likes my work, you know. And she, was, she basically was like, do you have any idea how many people submit their work to my gallery per month? And I, and I was like, no, I have no idea. She's like, probably two to 300. They send me large packets filled with, you know, resumes, images of their work, slides of their work, and you, you write down, hey, my name's Mike, I live around the corner. And she's basically giving me a lecture, you know? So I'm sitting there going, oh my, like, what? This lady, what is this? Uh, like, I kind of wanted to leave, you know? I'm like, I don't, you know, like, oh, this is crazy. She's like, but I like your work. I like your work. I'll give you an opportunity to show. So she let me be in a, a group show at the gallery. So she put her work up, she's like, and if it sells, I'll put you in another group show. So it sold, she put me in another one, and then eventually I had a solo show, which was huge, and it changed my career completely. I went from being a, you know, an artist that put a few works here and there throughout the city to you know, having solo shows every year, and then that led to me going to Switzerland, and then that led to you know, these giant installations, and then, and then unfortunately they closed down and I had to find a new gallery, and so, yeah, I'm stuck with Bo over here. And uh, yeah, and so now we've been continuing to delve into these projects. So, so what, what year was it when you first got your show there? So my first solo show there was in 2008. For my first solo show at Black Market, um, I was doing, um, I had a lot of works on the book pages, and I had a, a works on the actual just a cover of the book, like around the corner, there's a couple that have just a painting on the book, and I was doing those. And then when I was finished with them, I would just stack them up. And then one time I just kind of saw that the paint was coming over the side, so I did this piece, and I thought, you know, oh, that would be kind of interesting to paint on the, you know, the sides of the book. So I did one piece, and I, and I brought it to the gallery, didn't think anything of it, you know, and I brought it to the lady that yelled at me, and she, so I'm always, I was always kind of scared of her, because she was, <laughs> She was either really excited or really not interested in, in things you did. And I showed it to her, and she was like, Mike, this is amazing. Oh, I love this. This is so great. And we put it up, and it sold instantly. And, and actually, this is a great story. So about a week later, it's in the show. It sold. And I got the flu, and I was really sick. And I get a call from this gallery in Houston, Texas. The um, name of it is Rice Gallery. And it's a great big gallery. They do big shows. They give me a call. I don't know how they got my number. They called the gallery and some reason to give it. So this lady calls and says, oh, hi, I'm from Rice Gallery. You know, we're interested in showing you. And I was like, okay, that's great. You know, I'll call you back next week. I'm really sick and blah, blah. It's a university, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's Rice University. So, you know, I'll call you back. And then I, so I called the lady at the gallery and I said, hey, you know, this, this place called me uh, Rice University. And she was like, What? What do you mean? What did they say? I'm like, oh, I told them I'd call them next week. She's like, no, 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 no. You're going to call them right now. Call them right now. And I was like, okay, okay. So I call these people, and they, they wanted me to come out and do an installation. So they said, when can you come out? And I said, well, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm sick. I can come out, you know, Monday. And they said, okay, we'll book your ticket. So they booked a ticket, picked me up at the airport, brought me to their space, and they said, we want you to do one of these little ones here. And it was a wall that was 16 by 44 feet. And I was like, yes, yes, of course, yes. And I just said yes the whole time. Went home, and then when I got there, I had like the absolute just breakdown of like, what did I say yes to, you know? And I told the lady, I was like, I gotta be honest, like I'm extremely intimidated by this project. And she was like, you know what, Mike? We love what you do and we trust you. If you work a week and you don't like it, we'll tear it down and you can start again. And so that was the beginning of the biggest thing I ever did. And now it's snowballed all over the place. So they supplied all the books? Right? They supplied all the books. So that was all Texas library books. I have three libraries in LA that I get books from, and I couldn't possibly take all the books that they could give me. There's that many books that go bye-bye, which is a very sad thing. Any, so. Any yeah. Uh, before, uh, have you ever think before that uh, you can hurt the feelings of the author of the book before you're gonna paint? You know? I, I'm sorry. Have you ever think before that you can hurt the feelings of the author of the book because you are doing that as a canvas? Well, their book was in the trash, so <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> um, I don't know. I still have yet to meet an author that I've painted over.
It is a good question. Because, because they're also an artist. Yeah, no, I, I totally get it, you know. To stay on that question, what kind of reactions have you gotten, positive, negative, yeah. from people seeing the books in the video? Ninety-five percent of the people are very positive. Uh, Five percent of the people think I just go and ruin books, you know, until they figure out that, oh, he's, you know, he's re he's getting books from the trash, and then he's painting on the books, and then they can, you know, wrap their head around it. But uh, I had one lady that was really mad at me. She was like, "I can't believe you paint on books. How dare you paint on books?" You know, and she was lecturing me, and I was at my show, and I was like, "Well, you know, I and and actually the the books that I painted on in that show, I literally got out of a dumpster. It was me and another homeless guy going through a bin, you know, <laughs> and I was like, "Well, I got them out of a dumpster," and she's like, "Well, I don't care. I still think they should go somewhere. Somebody should have these." And so I said, "Do you want them?" And she said, "No, I don't have any room for them." And I was like, well, then this, what is it? I don't understand the point of this conversation, you know? You can have all these books right now, the whole thing. And she was like, I don't have any room for them. And I was like, well, I think that that's the problem with most of the books. The libraries don't have any room for them. They have the sale, then they try to give them away. Nobody wants them, you know? It's just become, it's going to go here or the landfill. So, but she was still mad. <laughs> that was the only really negative reaction I've ever had. I'm sure there's a, I'm sure there's a pattern for the discarded books. Who are the authors who most frequently show up in these discarded books? No. Oh. Tom Clancy, Daniel Steele. They're the kings. Daniel Steele is the the queen. I, I mean, there's probably a hundred of her books in here, and I constantly get her books, over and over. But she's very prolific too, so. Discarded romance. Discarded romance. <laughs> Sir, you and another homeless guy. Were you ever homeless? No, I wasn't homeless, but. <laughs> you said homeless. Yeah. I was close. How's that? <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Please don't be shy. Yeah. So what book have you, are you currently reading or have um, I just re finished reading a book called Cornbread Red, which was a, actually about a pool player that traveled around the U.S. playing in the early 50s. Yeah. Anyone else? Come on. <laughs> yeah, oh, there we go. Yeah. No, no, it's it, it's glued in sections. So her question was, you know, are they glued? So they're glued in sections of about, you know, 10 books. And then it goes across, and then it's another 10 books, and they sit like bricks all the way up. So no, you can't pull a book out that you want to read. But they all are readable. They'll just have a little paint on them. I think there was a question there. Yeah. I think the best experience was the Rice University when I did the, the first big piece there because I, it, it was really a stepping stone of, of mentally just to wrap my head around moving to the next step so rapidly, you know, and I could have very easily backed out of that and kept doing the, the safe thing that I was doing, but I took a big risk and, and did that and I, and I felt really good about that. Um, the negative experience I have probably was I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was negative but it was funny was, was in Italy I did a, a large installation it was about 12 feet tall a couple thousand books and it was in a train station so I said okay I need 2,000 hardcover books you know do you have libraries there and she said oh yes 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 we have plenty of books to get rid of here no problem no problem I was like they have to be hardcover she said okay no problem and so when I showed up it was half hardcover half softcover so I was like oh these aren't going to work and she's like I'm sorry that's it that's, that's all you get that's, you have to make it work so I'm like okay no problem so I pull all the books out into this train station 
and there's hundreds of people walking by, and they start coming over and grabbing handfuls of books. And nobody speaks English. They're all speaking in Italian, right? And they're grabbing books, and I'm like, no, 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 no. And they're like, oh, and they're just, they're just pulling these books like it's just a pile of free books, right? And so there's two, I have two assistants, and I was like, tell, and they don't speak English, so I'm like, tell them they can't take the books, and they're like, hey, you know? And they're like, and I was like, so I call this lady, and I'm like, they're stealing the books, you know? <laughs> So she comes down there, and she's like, no, and she's speaking to them, and she, they're still taking the books, and she's saying, no, no, no. So they have to call security, and security runs over, and it's like blocking everybody off, right? And then they have to build a fence around me. So I have this, like, chain-link fence around me in the installation and a guard that sits with me the whole time. And so then the entire time I'm painting it, people would surround the fence, right? And they would shake the fence. <laughs> And they would speak to me in Italian. And they would go, hey, hey. Like the, I mean, for, for, it took me two days. They would do it the whole time for two days. And then when I would turn around and I'd say, yes, they'd go, hey. <laughs> and that was it. It wasn't like a question or anything. They just had to get my attention to say hi. So that would probably be the most negative. But it was, now that I look at it, it was hilarious. But at the time, it stressed me out, you know. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Il yeah. Well, I wasn't... Il um, I didn't illustrate anybody else's books. Oh, yeah, he asked if I, had, if I had experience illustrating in books. I wasn't illustrating for them, though. I was, illustra I was making my own illustrations in their book. <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, I've done a couple book covers, though. Uh, I've done a, a handful of book covers and record covers and shirts and things like that and goggles. Every once in a while, I, I do things like that. But it's not my career. If I like the project, I'll do it. I saw a hand over there somewhere. Question? No. Yes. I know you. Yes, you do. <laughs> um, now that you're doing shows in countries where people actually accept and make use of cast-offs, what kinds of reactions are you anticipating to the kind of work you have? In other countries? I mean, in countries like this one, where we actually do... I mean, like your experience in Italy, where people really just kind of flocked like vultures onto all these free books. Yeah. But then here, we actually do... We don't have enough books. I mean, we, I know that's, a, that's yeah. what they were saying. That, that yeah, exactly. It's like we are a culture that accepts what other, um, not not necessarily culture. We're a nation that accepts what other people regard as castoffs. What kinds of reactions are you anticipating to your work? So far, it's been 100% positive. Everybody's really been into what I've, I'm doing, you know. And um, I suppose it would be a different story if I was painting books that were getting thrown out here. But obviously, that's not the case. So. I don't know. I, I don't know what to expect. So far, it's been positive. 